So I'll be talking a little bit more tomorrow on, on the management uh, of Steven Johnson syndrome in the, in the acute phase. Uh, this is just a video showing the surgical technique that we use for applying amniotic membrane. It's actually from a case that I saw a little over 10 years ago, but we still do it essentially the same way because it, it's worked well, so I haven't changed it much. So I'll, I'll go through kind of some of the subtler points. It's about a, I think about a four minute long video. If you have questions, you can throw your hand up or I'll catch me after the session. I'm happy to chat with you. If I can get, uh, it's not, am I doing it wrong? It's like I'm not wanting to play. Click it somewhere. Yeah, I'm trying to. Just play. on top it's safe play, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be nice if I could pause it though. But so this year old girl, uh, she's about four days into her episode of Stevens Johnson. You can see kind of the thick, thick membranes on the eye. Um, and so she, the other thing you'll notice that the edge of the eyelids are very white, and that it's all necrotic tissue, and it it all comes off when you get them in the operating room, and just peels away. So when we have extensive sloughing of the mucosal tissues, mucosal skin, uh, we try and cover as much as we can with amniotic membrane. Uh, we usually start with the eyelids. I'll show you that here in just a sec. Initially, we, we trim the eyelashes down as close to the skin as we can uh, so that the membranes will be intact tissues. So let me see if I can pause. Is there a way for me to pause it? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Good. Usually I have little icons on my computer. Um, so we, we use the cryopreserved amniotic membrane. In the United States, it's from, from biotissue, uh, distributes it. And we get a three and a half centimeter square. Uh, and I, I cut it in half. And half a piece is just about the right size to do the eyelid, one eyelid, uh, including the eyelid margin and the back of the eyelid. And they'll show you that here. So we do this procedure that I'm showing you for each eyelid. Uh, and so we, we place the membrane externally uh, covering about maybe a couple millimeters of the, of the external portion of the eyelid. And then we fixate it along the edge. Uh, we, we use an 8 nylon running stitch with a few bites. And then once we have it fixated to the external skin, uh, it's basically it's draped over the edge of the eyelid and then into the fornix. And it covers almost the entire palpebral conjunctiva. And then we take a, a double-armed 6-0 proline. I like to use proline because it's pretty inert. It doesn't really add to any inf inflammation. Uh, and we pass it full thickness. You want to make sure you get through the membrane and then all the way through the lid. We tie it over some sort of bolster. This is just some, some IV tubing that we used at the time to, to pass soft IV tubing to pass the needles through. Uh, so we take the other end and we passed it through in a similar fashion and then we're tying the knot. And uh, we usually use two, two sutures uh, per eyelid. And we, the, the two needles are passed through the eyelid about you know, maybe close to a centimeter apart from one another. And doing that allows you to, to get the whole membrane nicely pressed up against the palpebral conjunctiva. So we basically, we do that for each lid. And then we take a full three and a half centimeter square and we place it on the surface of the globe. We don't have to do this portion as much as we used to. When I first started doing it almost 15 years ago, we, we weren't quite sure how to do it or what would be best. So we used to always cover the entire surface of the globe with a sheet of amniotic membrane. And probably eight or nine out of 10 cases that we see now, if there's not extensive sloughing of the bulbar conjunctiva, we'll do the eyelid portion and then we'll place a procara on the eye and it provides coverage of the cornea, the limbal area, and a little bit of the bulbar conjunctiva. 
and you also get the, the ring portion of the Procara provides the, the, pro, the symblepharon ring effect to keep the eyelids separated from the globe. What I'm doing here initially is just dropping uh, epinephrine drops. It's 1 to 1,000 epinephrine, so fairly concentrated epinephrine, uh, just to help decrease the bleeding. If we get a, a, a blood vessel bleeding underneath the amniotic membrane, I'll remove it, rinse it out, and make sure you get the bleeding stopped, because it, it can make it quite messy, and it probably, I think, decreases the effectiveness of the membrane if there's a bunch of blood underneath. So I like to put a little dot in the middle of the membrane so I can make sure I position that over the pupil so that I have enough membrane to cover and I don't get off center with it. And what we've done here is uh, we've taken a 10 nylon running stitch and we basically, it's about maybe six or eight bites about a, a couple millimeters back from the limbus and done, gone 360 degrees around the cornea in a, sort of a purse string fashion. Uh, to hold it close over the cornea. I, I leave it intact over the cornea, whether it's a child or, or in an amblyogenic period or not. It's, it's not going to be there that long, and we're doing both eyes, so it's not going to induce amblyopia. And the, the vision's a little blurry, certainly, but I think it's a small price to pay for uh, hopefully a, a lifetime of not having bigger problems. Um, so once we get the, the membrane uh, sutured there, I, when we cut it, we leave the tails of the suture very long so they lie down nice and flat. It also helps later on when you're trying to find the sutures to remove them if they're nice long sutures that you can find. And then we just take a muscle hook and we rotate the eye to expose the, the uh, oblique quadrants. And we try and get a good bite, not necessarily into sclera, but certainly you want to get down into the tenons and some episclera. A good thick bite. And it's just a single interrupted suture in each of the four oblique quadrants. And then I'll usually put one near the medial and lateral canthus. And just with those little stitches, you have the membrane nicely covering uh, basically all of the mucosal surfaces. Like I said, a, for a lot of cases now, we don't have to do the whole uh, suturing to the surface of the eye. Um, but if there is extensive sloughing, uh, we certainly do. And I'll, I'll go through that in more detail tomorrow. And then once we're done, when we've sutured it to the globe, then we place a large symblepharon ring. I like this particular style because it, it has a, a larger uh, portion in the temporal aspect. So it really covers the, the surface and it pushes the membranes right up against the mucosal surfaces that you're trying to protect. Uh, that's basically it. And then we, a couple of important things though, once you've placed the membrane is to it, these patients are generally in the intensive care unit in our hospital. I instruct the nurses on how to take care of it. I tell them not, you know, not to be careful when they're, usually these patients, are, uh, their faces are a mess because they're sloughing so much skin. Uh, but just to be careful as they're wiping not to catch the bolsters, but they, they don't have to be scared of them. And I also show them, we generally apply uh, Tobradex or a combination antibiotic steroid ointment to the lid margins, and that's really important. I have them do that about at least four times a day, because if the membrane gets, dries out on the edge of the eyelids, it, it doesn't do any good. So I, I tell the nurse, this is, they're busy trying to keep the patient alive, but I tell them this is one of the most important things you'll do, and it seems very simple. Uh, but just keeping that membrane moist with the ointment is really important, I think. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Darren, for a very, very uh, clear uh, message. So this is a very short video, and basically it's a different way of placing it. I don't really know which is better. But here we've taken a piece of sterile IV tubing, we've cut a slit in it, and made a circle. And that circle can be custom fit. So we want a full symblepharon ring to really fill the fornices. It should be big enough to fill them but not prevent eyelid closure. If the eyelid has lagophthalmus, the circle is too big. Then we take a 10 by 5 sheet of amnion, so it's a single sheet, doesn't require much manipulation. Uh, and we're now using cyanoacrylate glue, actually, at this step, instead of suturing, which makes it really fast. The lashes have already been trimmed, um, I believe, in this video. And uh, so this is being bolstered. So the upper lid is being done first. 
So the, this sheet you'll see in a second come off. So the membrane's being pulled off, and then it's stretched over the lower lid. Now you take this bolster, which is, again, custom fit for that eye, and you use this, uh, this tubing, custom fit for the eye, and you use this to uh, push the membrane into the fornices, as you'll see here in a second. It's not a very long video. Mm -hmm. Jim, do you clean off the ocular surface? Uh, yeah, everything you, that Darren, yeah, the debris needs to come out. Debris, um, the membrane yeah. or pseudo-membrane. Yeah, all of that gets stripped out. Um, this was, you know, my purpose here was just to show you an alternative to what Darren showed you. Not better, just different. And you see, we're just sort of spreading the membrane out so it doesn't get bunched up. Because there's actually, the, the, again, with cyanacrylate glue, there's no sutures at all. But there's no other sutures except for these two through the lid. And it's, the, it's this ring, as you'll see, hopefully very shortly. You see, it's getting spread out. If you don't spread this, it's hard to do later. So now you push it in the upper fornix. And then you just have to get it to catch the lower lid so it gets under the lid. And you don't want to tear the membrane, obviously. So here we're using a Damar retractor. Yeah. Yeah, the membrane gets dry. It's very hard to work with and it can tear. So now it's being stretched and so the membrane, you know, you just want to check and make sure that it's really still spread out. And this is being done at bedside? or it's This is at bedside. As a matter of fact, I stop taking patients to the operating room unless it's a child. Uh, if the child is, you know, already intubated, then you can do it at the bedside. But our intensive care units, uh, at least at Mass General Hospital, they do not like to take the children out of the intensive care, or the patient out of the intensive care unit to take them to the operating room. So we were forced to do this out of necessity. Um, and, you know, it's not horrible. Actually, with cyanacrylate glue, you can do it on a patient that's awake yeah. because you're not passing any suture anything more than topical anesthetic. Yeah. And that's it. Lovely. Thank you, Jim. And thanks, Vikas, for inviting. So uh, this uh, idea was uh, launched two years ago, 2017 OSW. At that time, after, it took me two years to develop this device and get it market ready. Uh, so, so we have uh, Darren's classification, which came out in 2016, that if more than one third of the lead margin is involved, or if there is any epithelial defect at all on the cornea, then we should go in and do an amniotic membrane grafting. It is also well known uh, that amniotic membrane uh, grafting can be sight saving for the patient and can help us avoid all the chronic sequelae. So these are the kind of patients that we deal with and you have seen uh, Darren's video now. Imagine, close your eyes and imagine that you have to do it on the bedside in a hardly anesthetized, already painful patient. So it makes the job all the more difficult. So this is the video that uh, Darren showed, and I will not repeat it. But these are the kind of patients that we see, and this is the technique that uh, Jim showed. Any problem? So uh, some people also wrap the amniotic membrane in a conformer and place it in the eye. The problem is that the central part of the conformer uh, gets desiccated and if you don't maintain that part very well then you can end up with a corneal perf. Uh, we also talked about uh, Prokera. The issue with Prokera is that uh, it uh, does not extend right up to the limbus and uh, right up to the fornix and it covers only a small area near the limbus. So the uh, simlepheron uh, problem is not taken care of. Yeah, Vina, it's my phone ringing. <laughs> I think you can put the bag outside. Uh, so we felt that the need for a device which would be easy to perform at the bedside be as atraumatic as possible and be able to address the lids when required. It should also be cheap and it should be able to be assembled in the local eye bank. So uh, 
the design evolved over a period and I'll just take a few minutes of your time to show how the design evolved because when things look easy they're not that easy. So the first design that we had was an open C loop with a two holes eyelets with the idea that to tie a nylon thread and close the pull the thing together so that you could adjust the diameter of the ring. It didn't work because this thing was too big and too tough and it would, wouldn't stay in the eye. So then we came with an open C loop that you see on the second uh, image on top. But even this wouldn't work because the membrane wouldn't stay. Uh, the moment we tried to fix it on the lid, everything, the entire complex would come out because the ring was not fixed to the membrane. So last of all, we came up with a two-part design which you see in the bottom. And uh, this, is, uh, this has got a bottom part which has got a notch onto which the top ring fits and the amniotic membrane is sandwiched in between. The, right now we are having only one size that is 20 uh, in height and 24 wide and we came to this uh, design decision based on this paper which gave us the phonics anatomy of the South, South Asian population. So uh, this is a small animation in which uh, this is how it uh, comes and flips. So the elliptical design is basically to conform with the shape of the phonices and it is deformable with good memory. So you can actually hold it in your hands and you can compress it like an elastic, but it will retain, regain its original shape immediately. Uh, we also uh, stored it at uh, minus 80 degrees and saw that uh, the PMM was, PMMA was not becoming brittle after that. So long term storage with the amniotic membrane attached is also possible in case you want it for an emergency you just have to thaw it and use it. So these are the steps it comes in two parts both parts are individually sterilized it is now being uh, manufactured by Orolab and they have come up with the prototypes uh, it's now available not on the market but on request and uh, so you uh, place the uh, ring, then you have to layer the amniotic membrane on top of it, then place the second ring and press it fit. I'll show you a video of how it is done. So first the amniotic membrane uh, has to be kept wet and uh, laid on something sterile. And then the bottom part is slid under the amniotic membrane the, and the amniotic membrane is stretched, the bottom part is centered properly. So if you are also planning to do the lids, then uh, we have to keep a, uh, longer edges outside the amniotic uh, inserter. And then with the help of the assistant and two forceps in your hand, if you press, it just uh, clicks fit with the amniotic membrane held in position. Now uh, we have also tried putting uh, a double layer with uh, limbal pieces in between in the form of an slit because uh, this ring is also uh, planned to be used in uh, acute acid injuries where you have a total epithelial loss and maybe a allosilet can be planned. Even in acute SJS and acute alkali burn, sometimes you do need uh, double layers because double layer is likely to stay for a longer time. So uh, this is how the amniotic membrane inserted with the amniotic membrane complex is uh, uh, taken out of the petri dish, the eye is cleaned, the lids are held apart with uh, Desmar's retractor and you can just uh, hold it in your hand or in forceps and you can slide it down in. So two years the journey is complete, Dr. Sangwan you are telling me in Keracon that you should let others use it, so I am in a position now. And we are opening up this device for use by all persons who are interested. Uh, we are forming a users group and uh, there will be a link in the Orolab website through which you can enter, enter the basic data and a ring will be sent by mail, free of cost right now. Start Kardo Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very nice. Last bit uh, you showed about uh, the limbal explant is very interesting. It is called the AMSERTER, A-M capital S-E-R-T-E-R. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now uh, open for questions, comments, and this will be led by Dr. Rajesh Fogla, Sahil, and Ritin. Please. Yes, Jaren. I have a question for Jim, actually. If, uh, as you 
build your your homemade ring, do you have tips on kind of figuring out how to size it? So it's just guesswork. I take a piece of tubing, I cut a slit in one half, and you need some heavy uh, clamps to push one end into the other. I put it in the eye and see what happens. Usually it's too big because I always tend to overestimate personally how big I should make it, and then I see if I can close the lids comfortably over it. If the lids don't really close well, then I make it smaller. Um, I rarely have made one too small. I really like the idea of the last presentation. It's fantastic. Um, and then you could easily have a couple of different sizes, and it would probably account for everything. And that would make my work even faster because I wouldn't have to mess with the IV tubing. We could just take our sheet and do exactly as we're doing. It would probably take 10 minutes an eye, literally, to make the, the K-Pro. And I think that's important because... One of the problems is people say, oh, I have to go to the hospital. It's going to take so long, so much time away from my, the rest of the things that I have to do when taking care. You know, there's only a few people that have that, like, that focus just on SJS. Many of you are interested in it, but you may not have that much time that you want to go to acute care hospital and take care of the patient. Something like this would make it so much simpler. You could spend 20 or 30 minutes max, and you'd be out of the hospital again. So I think that's a great... Uh, a great idea, and uh, again, the, the longest part of our procedure now is putting that IV tubing together. Uh, what, what size? It's, uh, it's, so we make it for that particular patient because we go from little kids custom made. to adults. It's, oh, what gauge? The small, it's the smallest one, whatever. It's the smallest tubing they have. It has to be soft. Uh, it's, there's tubing that's soft and tubing that's rigid. If it's, too, if it's too rigid, you won't be able to put the ends together. I don't even remember. We just say, give us the smallest caliber IV tubing you have. And try usually that's uh, available to you. If yeah, not, if not you can try using a Riles tube. So uh, some of the questions I would like because to answer. That's, that's kind of very thin. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks to Jim. Uh, two years, three years back, I was inspired by your idea. Now, currently, I'm working in a multi-specialty hospital where I get to see uh, at least two patients per month of acute SJS in the acute setting, day two or day three. So in Alvi Prasad, uh, we were mostly getting chronic patients when we were not really exposed to the acute setting. Now in last three years, I would happen to have seen at least uh, 30 to 40 cases and an amniotic membrane, inspired mostly by your idea. Only two main changes which I made was, uh, whenever I would try to pass in a suture through the lid, without anesthesia, patient would wince with pain. So just out of trial, uh, hit and trial, I tried to just uh, spread the amniotic membrane onto the lid uh, skin. The skin is already denuded, it's all just dermis over there. Entire upper lid, lower lid, especially when you try to open the eyes, patient is trying to squeeze, the lid just comes off. So the AMG, what I was surprised to find, sticks beautifully to the dermis, does not need a uh, cyanoacrylate glue, does not need a fibrin glue, does not need a suture. Not even a single membrane out of the f uh, 30 cases I would have done has come off spontaneously by itself. We, we had, uh, so we've done that too. One of the issues is the nurses can't tell where the membrane is, and sometimes they clean it they off. Would. Having something there is actually just, not bad. Just warns them that, okay, it's, there's something there you don't need to, you should not remove it. Yeah. So, I, you know, I agree, but we, there's inconsistent amount of skin, and so we decided to place some glue uh, to try but, to uh, reinforce. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is uh, in 30 patients, if the, even a single membrane did not come off, that gives me a lot of confidence to say that yeah. even without a suture, without a fibrin glue, without a cyanocrylic glue, probably the membrane is going to stay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, second thing I would uh, like to answer about the sizing. So I did a X-ray orbit uh, PA view inspired by Dr. Sain uh, to find the sizing. So initially I was doing the same hidden trial, would put in a piece of tubing, but the problem once arose was sometimes these patients, when they specifically land up in ICU, their overall body tone becomes very poor. Uh, when the tone goes down, they have lag of thalmos. And in an acute SGS setting, the moment you have lag of thalmos, it leads to exposure and corneal melt. Uh, specifically, when the patient goes, to, uh, the systemic score becomes poor and the uh, uh, patient goes down or is into the ICU. So that's when I tried to find out a way, is there any way to determine sizing? And uh, that's when I tried an X-ray PA orbit. One of the advantages of uh, currently the tubing I'm using is uh, infant feeding tube number six, easily available in every pediatric center and every, with every neurologist. The advantage has it has a barium uh, line thing which is easily seen on X-ray. So when I did an X-ray uh, PA orbit, I could easily make out the ring and I would like to show everyone, I'm going to post that uh, X-ray photograph into the group. Uh, that ring can be beautifully seen inside the orbit. And uh, um, the only one ring, uh, ring which has extruded in last 30-odd cases was uh, something which had a diameter less than 30 millimeters. 
So I came up with the algorithm that you measure the Bonnier orbit to Bonnier orbit rim and decrease the diameter of your outer diameter of the ring uh, by approximately 6 to 10 millimeters lesser. If you find the patient is uh, as a poor tone or is systemically ill, you decrease the diameter by 10 mm so that your priority is the patient does not end with a lag of thalmos. And uh, uh, without glue and uh, with this appropriate sizing, I have found that uh, the extrusion rate has been only one case. And I think that also because the patient had some psychiatric issues. Uh, day five or day six when the patient became all right, he went to the bathroom and wanted to see what's there inside his eye. So he was looking into the mirror and next day he told me, I was looking into the mirror, I wanted to see what's there inside my eye. He looked into the mirror and tried to avert his li eyelid like this. So that's when the ring automatically came out and he showed the ring to me, doctor, this came out when I went to the bathroom to see what's inside my eye. But uh, the sizing can be taken like up care like this. I think using the infant feeding tube, which is easily available, uh, makes it much more uh, reachable uh, in reach of every uh, general ophthalmologist who does not have access to any specific ring. You just take an amniotic membrane large enough in size. Uh, and what I do is, uh, uh, as Dr. Shodosh was saying, instead of shifting to the ICU, you make a ring in the OT, you wrap around the amniotic membrane over the ring, and take that ring with the amniotic membrane, wrap around it into the, at the bedside. With the Desmos director, pull the lid, first insert one end, then insert the second end, and then unfold the amniotic membrane onto upper lid and lower lid. Sticks beautifully well, and I have not faced, personally, I have not faced any complication where the ring would have come off. <coughs> Does the side make a difference? Because sometimes when you put it on the ring and you're carrying it and you might flip it over, so whether you put it by so the stromal I side down or the epithelial side, down, does it matter in that situation or it, it's immaterial? I haven't, haven't seen any uh, case having a problem, but yes, ideally, probably basement membrane has to be down. So when I'm cleaning it and tying it on the ring, I try to make sure that the epithelium is outside, uh, basement membrane is down and epithelium is up. I find the way it makes a difference for me, I have no idea whether it makes a biological difference, but in managing the membrane, it's easier if you're sticky dealing with the non sticky down. side. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one troubleshooting question. Uh, I had a patient where I, ha I had to do. Uh, I had to do uh, amniotic membrane graft in acute SGS. Sahil shared this video, beautiful video, just a minute, a minute and a half, and that's exactly the time that it took. The one thing that I struggled with was after inserting the feeding tube, the ring opened. Can I leave it as it is? Or you now should, I'm struggling. Well, you what, should what, what not. What so next? the trick is when you are trying to insert the other end into the tubing, you have to dilate the other end so that it goes well in. You have to, the part you are going to insert, that also you should trim and make it like a, a V-shaped opening so that it fits in inside uh, easily. If the uh, male end of the tubing is cut like a V-shape and the female end is dilated with some forceps, then you should not have this opening. Few more things I would like to add is, uh, in uh, acute setting, whenever you are putting in the ring, try and make sure you tell the patient that day 10 it has to be removed. One patient, despite telling, came back to me at day 21. That's the time uh, when I tried to find out the ring, I could not. And only on X-ray could I confirm that the ring is still there. And uh, when I tried to separate the, uh, not only fibrosis, the conjunctal epithelium had grown over the ring. So I had to separate it, and I could not separate it. I had to cut that uh, layer of epithelium with Vana Caesar. Um, luckily the patient was cooperative uh, and it could be done, but please make sure that the patient does not come back with the ring, retain, ring uh, retained in the fornix and the simplefron and the epithelium growing over the ring. Yeah, it should be removed before they leave the hospital. Please, so 10 days. What so about, 10 days, yes. What about taking a scleral contact lens and putting amniotic on, on it and just inserting the scleral lens? Yeah, would, I, would that I work the same way? I think what I've learned, so the first case I did was a Procara only. The, the hospital wouldn't buy it. The patient bought it themselves. And what was uh, interesting was that everywhere the am amnion was touching looked normal, and everywhere it wasn't touching later had scarring and, and inflammation, <coughs> everything. So I really believe what Darren said, that you need to cover all of the all surfaces. The bare surfaces. So I try to cover as much as I can. I, you know, I think that's the goal. And uh, that's why I think any, you know, anything else is, is short of what you could do. And it's not that hard to get it all covered. So is staining important to see what are the denuded areas to help you decide whether you? Yeah, I, uh, again, learning from Darren, uh, fluorescent staining. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Because one of the questions is that should, uh, should we do AMG in all cases of SGS? Like uh, we, we've found, I mean, the fluorescein staining is kind of the key to our management in deciding what's a bad case and what's not. So um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a lot of detail tomorrow. But if, 
if there's very limited sloughing of the epithelium, then those don't usually lead to big problems in our experience. We, we used to scratch our head a lot and worry, you know, should we do this treatment for this person or not? And now it, I have my you know, published sort of grading criteria, but we don't always adhere to my own criteria. <laughs> you know, so there's not much downside to doing the membrane. If you're not sure, there, there's no, no one's going to fault you for doing it. But if you don't do it, and then there's a, a bunch of scarring and develops. If you're doing it bedside, then going and putting a fluorescent stain, you need a blue light, and you need to retract the lids and see. So it's kind of, you might as well as do off an amniotic yes, membrane rather exactly. than doing I all mean, that instead of doing all this, remove all the gunk membrane, everything, and stick a membrane, rather than trying to do a fluorescein and so the blue yeah, light. I, I, getting a blue light is not hard, and fluorescein staining is important for staging and for you to understand that what's happening. You won't learn anything about the patient unless you look at the exam before you place mm -hmm. the membrane. You'll never know what you're achieving with it. Uh, I, we are very aggressive with it now, and we stopped really asking the patient. We still have to get a consent, but we tell them you need this. So for me, if there's any lid margin sloughing or any surface uh, fluorescein staining that I can see, and we're not double averting or okay. looking in the far recesses for defects, we're looking by just pulling the lid down and pulling it up and looking at the lid margin, and for me, if there's defects, we place it because it gets too easy for our fellows to say, oh, it's not that bad, we'll wait. The other thing is, Darren has shown pictures, and I have one in my slide set from him, things can change very quickly. Very quickly. So he <laughs> might see the patient, and there might be a very small defect at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and by 8 o'clock that night, it's much different. So I think if there's sloughing, I use it. If there's no sloughing, I don't use it, and it's very simple to make that decision. All right. So uh, once that we're done with uh, applying an EMG, how frequently do we see these patients again? How often? We see them every day. Every day? Every day. Every day. So, and I used to, and when I was initially doing it, when I didn't really know what I was doing, I was seeing them oftentimes twice a day because some of them would change very quickly. Um, but yeah, we see them every day while they're in the hospital, uh, if, especially if we've done the membranes we rinse them with saline every day because a, a lot of they get a lot of serosanguinous junk that builds up on the eye, which is not helping them. And we rinse them so that we can see the membrane, looking for any any sign of any corneal infiltrate. If there's a little whitish area on on the membrane, I'll squirt it or I'll take a cotton tip swab and just make sure it's on the membrane and not underneath. Because if you start to get an infiltrate, it's usually you know. It's usually a, a difficult uh, thing to treat. They've usually been on steroids. They're on antibiotics. So you either get a multi-drug resistant bacterial infection or a fungal infection, and, the, and it's difficult. So we check them every day. I make sure that the nurses are doing their job, keeping the membranes moist with the ointment. Um, and I think that's been one of the keys to our success is just the close monitoring. And, and I learned a lot. You know, for the first eight years I was doing it, it was, it was me doing it. So I got to see how these things evolve and behave. I've sort of stepped back a little bit, <laughs> um, but I still am involved with it. But I train our residents and fellows to, to check it, and I kind of oversee now more than doing every little bit myself. All right. So any, um, any more questions from the audience? How do we keep the amniotic membrane moist over the lids on the exposed surface? Uh, Dan was just talking about that use ointment uh, two to three times a day during the day so that it remains moist, it doesn't dry up. So that's basically you can ap apply a steroid antibiotic or just an antibiotic ointment. So especially if we are using either this device or uh, Jim's uh, tubing, it is important to... Uh, tubing is not Jim's. Tubing is... Uh, Plastic, plastic tube. <laughs> it's important to it's see that uh, there is no defect in the amniotic membrane itself because sometimes the amniotic membrane melts and if it melts then there can be a synechia through the tube or through the uh -huh. uh, ring. All right, that lovely. Is very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in, in terms of the idea of showing different ways of applying the amniotic membrane does not mean these are the only ways. There can be many other ways you can innovate, you can given in your in environment circumstance, try to think how you can, the whole idea is to keep the membrane stuck on the surface 
And before you do that, clean up the surface of all the necrotic dead tissues, membranes, clean up all the gunk, and then stick the membrane. How you do it, you have given the different ways and means of doing it. In your situation, you may have to come up with your own technique. If we have a corneal infiltrate in an acute stage after uh, AMG? You want to answer that or do anyone? Uh, if there is an infection uh, on the cornea, and uh, do you want to treat what you want to do, Jim? I'm not worried about the membrane. I, I'm not going to put a membrane. I'm going to treat the corneal infection personally. Um, so I personally, we have not, it, again, it depends on the environment, but I, I worry about penetration of antibiotics if I have a membrane. I just don't know, and I want to treat the infection and know what's going on. I, if, the me if there's an infection when I see the patient, I'm just going to treat it and not put a membrane. If, the inf if you see an infection after, which I have not seen, have you, Darren? You had one? I'll, I'll talk about it tomorrow. I have one that was a fungal. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, that post-op management, I think we should talk a little bit about because uh, not living in open. In my view, the post-op management after the amniotic membrane also would involve frequent intense topical steroids, antibiotics, Lubricants. and whatever else lubricant, even homide or something. It's too important is antibiotic and the um, drops. Yeah, and so I'll talk about it again tomorrow, but the, we don't use, people will say they do aggressive lubrication with, you know, they're wanting to do drops every hour, and all I've found is that really aggravates the nurses having to do that. Um, and so we, we have them do, I do the rinse, we do the rinse every day. Uh, we don't really have them put on artificial tears because we're rinsing them. We have them, when we use a steroid, I u tend to use dexamethasone because it's less particulate uh, than, than prednisolone. Uh, it's more of a solution almost than a, sol than a solute or a, a suspension, yeah. Um, we use uh, restasis, we use cyclosporin drops. All of the, and I do everything a couple, a couple of times a day. I certainly wouldn't fault you if you do steroid more intensely because there's some published literature uh, from Mayumi's group in Japan, as well as uh, a group in New York that suggests that the, the frequent steroids are beneficial in decreasing the inflammation. And we put them on an, an antibiotic prophylactically, usually four times a day with moxifloxacin or another quinolone. So, so how important is the actual mechanical separation with the confirmer or ring versus just covering all the bare areas with membrane, whether it is with glue or sutures, because in the limited experience that we have without the confirmer, if we just manage to cover all the bare surfaces with the membrane, with sutures, glue, etc., they usually do well. So is that see, confirmer see actually... See, the confirmer, I think that what I understand would make sure that membrane is stuck on the circonjectile surface. Other all than around, that, all, other all than all that, around. Yeah. I don't so think you could ensure that anything. with sutures or something, yeah. It does, it does help with that. I think, pushing the membrane against. If you get this in blepharon where you have mainly, in, in the acute phase, where you have two raw surfaces touching one another. So if the membranes are keeping them apart, you generally won't form them. And I think, you know, Jim t has talked about it, and my experience too, you'll see if you have small areas, like near the medial or lateral canthus, where the membrane isn't quite covering things, you'll get small symblepharon there. So it, it really points to the effectiveness of just the membrane um, and usually those little small symblepharon aren't really consequential. I have had a couple of cases where the inflammation was so severe, I think the membrane dissolved very quickly in the fornices and I couldn't tell, and they developed symblepharon anterior to the ring, so that then I had to sort of cut the ring and pull it out rather than uh, tear everything. So it's possible. I think, you know, I, I would like to have actually a nice symblepharon. Sheffer Seng was working on what they called Procara X. They never went ahead with it. I think it was probably not going to sell enough units. But the idea was to make a larger uh, symblepharon. You know, it would be for adult use, not for children. And then they would have a large piece of amnion attached that then you could drape over the lid and it would be a one-stop thing with no manipulation. I really like the idea of this snap-in, um, you know, flexible uh, ring, which would save everybody a lot of time. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Yes. 
Sir, uh, in acute SGS, uh, like there is a lot of inflammation. So when we put the amni amniotic membrane, uh, how many days we expect it to stay and uh, it gets absorbed? In yes, a how many days it will last? Uh -huh. Normally, or if you have to repeat, how many days after you repeat? Yes, All and right. tell when we should repeat. Uh, we we use, I usually, if they look pretty severe initially, I'll, I'll advise. We lost your mic. And the patient, if they're awake, that we may be doing this again in seven to ten days. So usually, usually it lasts about a week, but sometimes it does dissolve a little bit sooner. Uh, and we just we tell them we may be doing it again. I think I agree with the conformer being a great idea. We've been we've been hoping for something like that for a long time uh, because the when I was initially doing it, the you know we did a few two or three at the bedside. And the way we were doing it, it took us three or four hours, and it was, it was terrible. <laughs> um, and one of my colleagues, we were doing it, he got chest pain and had to go to the emergency room. <laughs> it was very, very difficult. So uh, the conformer, one of the things we've been hoping is to make it more user-friendly so that it's not so labor-intensive and difficult. And I hope that the conformer will make it so that just about any ophthalmologist can do it, and it's not so so difficult so so we've been you know removing the ring as soon as the membrane appears to break down but to throw a wrench in the works uh, I don't know if you know Ahmed Kirka but yeah, yeah. so he's uh, he's now in San Antonio so he's been telling me that uh, the membrane should be removed and replaced at four days because so one of the things that amnion membrane does is it acts as a sink for bone marrow derived cells that are on the surface so it actually binds and prevents inflammatory cells from doing bad things to the eye. And that, that process is kind of gets exhausted at about four days. And he thinks we should be replacing the membrane at four days. Uh, I don't have any clinical evidence that that's true, but there's uh, 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 Dr. Kim from, South, from Seoul was using amnion in um, pterygium. So he would glue down amnion, and at four days or three days, I think, he would take it off, and it would be loaded with bone marrow drive cells that kind of stuck to it. And then in his work, he didn't place any other graft and the, and the pterygium were healing up nicely. So then he was highlighting the role of infiltrating cells in creating pseudopterygium after pterygium removal. So I've been thinking about this and wondering whether we might make things even better if we were replacing the membrane early. And I have no evidence, but it's just Kirka's idea based on his research. Right. Um, yes. My question is a little offbeat. I would like to Microphone know, closer to Yeah, um, um, it's a little offbeat. I just wanted to know, uh, how do we make the dermatologists or the burn ICU people who are managing, how do we make them uh, realize the importance of uh, an ophthalmology referral in the acute stages? So how many of these patients actually get to this a AMG? I don't have any problem with the burn. Right, so All right. only the ones in the multi-specialty hospitals oh. with... Uh, internal referrals actually reach to the stage I, I where think, the AMG I think the, Purvasa, the, the way you can do is maybe start uh, making friends with dermatologists, uh, start participating in their meetings. And no, dermatologists or whosoever manages in the acute burn units. Yeah, so we will have someone talking about. So basically making friends and going out and mixing with them and showing what, what is possible. So, uh, <laughs> So the surgeons here in India are well ahead of us in a lot of the reconstruction after SJS. But the U.S. is ahead in use of amniotic membrane and acute phase, thanks to Darren. But what's happening is that now it's becoming a medical legal issue in the U.S. If the patient with SJS is not seen by an ophthalmologist, and if that ophthalmologist does not consider use of amniotic membrane, they can be sued by the patient for their complications. So there's pressure now coming as more and more publications come out that's going to force our ICUs to call ophthalmology. They only call ophthalmology in two-thirds of the ICUs, only routinely call them. So we have still a lot of work. But two-thirds of all burn ICUs are calling ophthalmology in the U.S., and maybe it's 5% in India, I'm guessing. So you can see that progress. You have to create the noise in the system, and patients learn, and then you put pressure and we don't like pressure on physicians because who wants to be sued? But on the other hand, this is what we need for the best of our patients. So you have to do it. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, I have Thank to, uh, you. I have yes. two questions. Uh, one, uh, what percentage of your patients would require a repeat amniotic membrane grafting after say seven to ten days when it melts? And two, uh, I've seen that the uh, palpebral amniotic membrane gets a lot of times integrated into the upper lid and the conjunctiva grows above the amniotic membrane, in which case uh, the amniotic membrane continues to shed or uh, which looks like keratinization in the subacute stage, uh, like between two to three weeks if the amniotic membrane is integrated. It part of it continues to shred and looks like it is all rough and keratinized. Both lumbar question <laughs> <laughs> So See, do, you, do you share a similar opinion? <laughs> and have you seen? No, that? if 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 Darren has uh, this covered in your talk tomorrow, uh, this repeat membrane when you do how many this? If you have, we'll keep it a suspense till tomorrow. Yeah, um, and it, if if we see, I'll talk about how it, the criteria for repeating it is a little less little less defined, um, but I'll I'll talk about that tomorrow. And the, we do see sometimes the membrane sort of getting incorporated into the tissue. When we're seeing them, like in a child, we'll usually do an exam under anesthesia a week or so after we apply the membrane. And if, there, if there's anything, we'll usually remove it and then decide, should we do it again? Um, and we kind of prepare for that ahead of time. If, if there are areas uh, where the membrane looks like it's integrated and stuck, we don't rip it off. We, we let it be. Um, and we, anything that's clearly loose, we will remove. But uh, we've let it just stay there. And eventually, the stuff that isn't necessary will s seems to slough off. Thank you. Uh, more questions, comments, quick? Yes. Does the membrane hinder absorption of topical drugs or not? Sir, does the membrane hinder absorption of topical drugs or not? Does the amniotic membrane interfere in absorption of antibiotics or other medication? Uh, before, no, there are uh, some studies in the in vitro studies and in rabbit studies that they have used amniotic membrane as a vehicle to uh, deliver the medicine. So you uh, put the amniotic membrane in antibiotic and uh, the, it releases the antibiotics for a longer time. So it may actually be a, you know, it has been considered for a variety of things. Clinically, I don't know how, how often or how many people have used it. What are your view? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've talked with the people at BioTissue that distribute our amniotic membrane, and it does seem to act like a bit of a depot. Uh, so hopefully the drops are there and not completely being prevented from arriving at the tissues underneath. And also the, the amniotic membrane is, is reported to have some inherent antibacterial properties by itself. So it... It may serve two benefits there. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or before? Okay. So what is the anesthesia uh, you required? Because I was enthusiastic. I went to one patient and he did not allow me to touch him because he was in so much of pain. Just by touching, all the uh, dermis goes off and all the nerve endings become exposed. So it is so difficult. It looks easy, but it, I had a very hard time. So yeah. what time of anesthesia? Yeah, yeah it, it's kind of selfish, but it, the patients are much easier to manage when they're sicker, <laughs> when they're really, really sick and they've been intubated. I, I'm happier, hopefully they, not because they're sick, but because it is much easier to manage their eyes. Um, we, we sedate them. I mean, if we had to do something at the bedside, you can usually, uh, it, they're usually in the hospital setting, so they can be sedated pretty heavily. Um, we may use a little bit of local anesthesia, uh, especially in a, in a child, although the first time, we did a few at the bedside, and then, our, and then we had a child who had it, and we couldn't do it at the bedside, and we had to take him to the operating room, and I was like, oh, this is so much better <laughs> in the operating room. So we always try and go to the operating room, although with the conformers and stuff now, it may be easier. Um, but the, we usually sedate them. Or, or if the, it's not very sick, like only the eye and the mouth are involved, and patient is otherwise awake and you know not intubated or anything, then maybe you can th uh, do it in the main OR. You can do a one lint block uh, so that you know lid spasm is gone. So you, you be a little uh, more uh, innovative. Not only what you are hearing that what we do is works. So you should think of okay how I can manage in this situation not only just by surface anesthesia or, uh, uh, you know, um, full anesthesia, can you do something modified? I think the use of the muscle hook is really good to try and pull the lid rather than trying to put a speculum with, with or something that, yeah. like that because 
that's the painful part and even if you try to you know pull the lid like that with your finger or something it's difficult so use a muscle hook so that's nice yeah use my yeah. all right so if you if if you know we have more interesting uh, surgeries to show and uh, i hope that uh, we can go to the next session unless you have very very pressing question from the audience one or two otherwise we'll go to the next session